Yeah, I think every generation you've got like maybe about 10 wild guys or girls. And you know, if they group together, and at that time they grouped together here in Clamberis in a way, and started doing wonderful things and they were happy to explore, you know, Snowdonia and jump off things or do great routes and just have a lot of good fun and party and it was good. It was fun. There was less government. There were weird hairstyles. There was more sex. And when you traveled somewhere, it wasn't as easy as now. You didn't get kind of a cheap flight. You know, sometimes you had to hitch to get to Czechoslovakia or somewhere. And you know, it was like the Iron Curtain still existed and all kinds of things. And I don't know, there was a bit more hope, I think, than now. It was just fun. People just used to come here from anywhere and everywhere. Climbers from Australia, you know, America. A lot of things came together here. Uh, there was lots of routes to do. Wales was, um, there'd be a new cliff, you know, to discover and climb. There'd be this slate behind us and, um, you know, hundreds of routes were done in the 80s, hundreds. And they're still quite hard today, some of those, you know. Standards advance, but boldness probably doesn't. You know, that mad streak that's in some people, there's only a certain level. You can't really push that level. You can push your physical ability, but not that level of madness or, or you know, sheer joy of risking your life. <laughs> yeah, the 80s were good. But, you know, some people just want to do great routes and, um, or be, you know, scared. And, and slate provided a lot of that because it's such a kind of flat, strange, slippery medium that even if you're a good climber, you feel insecure on it. And um, so a lot of the routes were developed in a kind of bold style to keep, to keep yourself on edge, as it were. And even today, they're still the same. I think the colours personally are beautiful and... Um, this strange climbing is really interesting. Provides different moves. And all of this really helps. And if you take a long fall down a slab, it's quite, it's quite peculiar. But um, yeah, the slate was great. There was just a whole bunch of us. I, I, one of the peculiar things, it was, it, it was hard to catch on. You know, it's obvious now, but in those days, people would laugh at you and say, why are you climbing on that rubbish and that slate tip? And, but Joe Brown was there before, he thought it was very exciting. And then there was me, and then after that, Johnny Dawes and Johnny Redhead, they were a great influence. They did some of the better routes. Sylvester did some really, you know, some nice ones. There was just, you know, a lot of people, and it didn't cost very much money, so you could go and do it. And there, there was room for imagination there as well. Big routes, little routes, beautiful routes. Dangerous routes. Right, Stevie. You're, All right. <laughs> you're responsible for what must be the, the most popular route on slate at the moment, the modern classic, comes to Dervish. Yeah. When you did it in 1982, did you think it was going to be that popular? Well, I thought so, but no one else seemed to at the time. So I suppose I was vindicated in the end. <laughs> You thought it was really good when you first did it? Yeah, I thought it was excellent. Is it true that you cleaned it out with cutlery from uh, PT? Yes, it is. <laughs> thank, thank you, Peter. <laughs> what's, uh, what's taking your interest at the moment? Well, I still do a bit of climbing, but I prefer a bit more of a buzz, you know. I prefer a bit more of an instant buzz. I suppose I could show you, couldn't I, really? Oh, Cheerio, young man. Goodbye. Whoa!
can you remember the day um, at Dorothea? Can you remember the, you know, when you jumped off the cables there? Can you remember with I Manuel and little Paul? Just about remember it, yeah. Can you go through what you do remember? Can you remember the sort of excitement of it, or you know, the sort of who was going to do it first, the psyching? I remember I wasn't even supposed to jump. I don't think, and then I had to take over, and then of course I wanted to, but when you're faced with a jump like that. You know, there's plenty of excuses that can cross your mind. I was quite scared that time. Then I was due mooring because it was going up and down really badly. Like coming well, back with down. the wind? Yeah, it was just bouncing up and down. I was getting seasick really badly. Mm. Oh, I remember having arguments with Jim about the amount of solo loading he did and telling him he was going to die and him just laughing in my face and saying he was enjoying himself and for me to shut up. And I should have just shut up because he was enjoying himself. And he had a great life. When he used to climb, he was totally free and really happy. It's nice to see someone without a rope, 200 feet up in the air, free. It's just wonderful. You know, it's not for everybody, but it's, it's great. It's a liberating thing. He was nearly as good without a rope as he was with a rope. And that's almost genius, I think. This is a film about the ultimate experience in rock climbing. It's a film about soloing the hard, classic roots of Snowdonia. It was made in 1986 and stars the main exponent of this deadly game from that period, Jimmy Jewell. It's a film about boldness and total self-reliance. It's a film about having the balls to live out your self-belief. It begins here on Dinas Cromlech in the Llamberis Pass with Jimmy soloing the left wall of Cenotaph Corner, a climb that still ranks as the most fallen off route in Wales. Except that for Jimmy, Falling isn't an option.
Jimmy climbed left wall six times for this sequence. Don't talk to me when I'm climbing, he told the cameraman. He wanted nothing to come between him and the necessary intensity of his concentration. As to the 800 feet of climbing he performed in repeating it six times, Jimmy once said, I may not be able to pull on the smallest holds, but those I can pull on I can pull on all day. We catch up with Jimmy here as he starts the top groove of the Grasper on Craig Bulchamach at Dramatic, an insecure and technical pitch on overhanging rock. Insecure there. Oh, yeah. <laughs> Don't like that one, do you? Sorry? Don't like that one. Uh, nice one. Right. Nice one, Jim. Next. <laughs> Next in the repertoire is Joe Brown's technical uber classic on the same cliff from 1960, Vector.
25 years before Jimmy's ascent. It was the last word in technical difficulty. century the plateau of achievement has risen and Jimmy's just walking across it Yeah, 
Okay, I'm going now. Much harder than Vector for the soloist is Silly Rett on Craig Pantivan. are tiny, like a dusting of sugar across the dolerite. You're in balance, but there's seldom a good holder, point of certainty, to base the sequences around. So the demand for precision and control becomes ever more absolute and the objective risk will that sugared quartz crunch into dust is creeping in now to weigh against the illusion of total control. Okay, lads. Nice going, Jim. It must be tea break now. <laughs> Bloody starving. Bravo, lads. Things you do to enjoy yourself. <laughs> Impressive looking. <laughs> When you're good enough, you'll be too old. I know, yeah, that's trouble, yeah. It's a, it's a bit pity about youth. Ah. <laughs> Great stuff. Wasted on the young. <laughs> <sighs> oh, good God. beautiful. We're shifting now from minor to major. From the cosy domesticities of Dramada to the elemental grandeur of the Anglesey Sea Cliffs. This is big, serious country, and Jimmy's here to make the first solo ascent of Tyrannosaurus Rex, Laurie Hollywell's great classic from 1969. He's only going to do this climb once, soloing in real time. So here you are, in a single take, out there on some of the flakiest rock in creation. Yes, I really enjoy this type of route. Steep, powerful, fast climbing, 
in an isolated situation. Due to the salty air and the time of year, the flake remains damp for most of the day. And it's not until the sun finally gets around that it starts to dry out. My chalk bag is virtually three quarters full. I dip my hands in generously and dusting the flake above, I make an effort to make the layback moves above now more secure. As I go through the crooks now, I feel that I really am totally committed. There is no way now that I could reverse those moves below. And I bridge out in an awkward position as the flake leads around now to the right. I'm now still completing strenuous moves. Within a few feet, I reach the sanctuary of a groove where I can bridge out, stand in balance and rest my arms. One more pull. That's it. First time I've solo T-Rex. We want to do it for a long time. At the bottom you're apprehensive, even butterflies in your stomach. But as soon as you go, everything winds on automatic. you climb now you're completely absorbed standing on little footholds and fingers seducing small flakes you move around changing your balance moving your feet touching the rock feeling for secure holes the hand travers a line of weakness that can be seen leading across to the right Although of a low technical difficulty, the rock is a little suspect and demands care and sound judgment. The wall is, is vertical and an attempt to take the weight from your hands. You try to use your feet as much as possible. Your hands shuffling down the flake now looking for the most secure point. The other hand joins it over above and crosses it. And you step down, concentrating on your feet. Now into quartz holes which, which are very, very suspect, seemingly stuck on with adaldite. And one more pull. So you step across and you reach the ledge. feel particularly pleased with myself now, having completed the crux of the climb. Although the next few feet above, as you can see, the line which runs in the shadow is known as the concrete chimney. A steep, friable type of rock, which gets its name from the fact that it resembles a very mixed concrete. But the flake which skirts it is of a steep, brittle nature. But as you work out the sequence of moves and the best ways to use the holes, concentrating hard, willing them to, to be secure, you step up. In a few more feet, you reach the easier angle slab above.
you must always approach solo climbing with a calm and relaxed nature not aggressive or, or, or arrogant even you get your best control and you climb the most efficiently when you're more calm and relaxed The friction here, which the rock offers, is superb. Delicate step across the slab brings you to, to, to establish a wide bridge across the groove. And easier climbing now remains above you. Fitness is a, a very important part of the approach to climbing. Hours spent in hours a week spent in a gymnasium really gives you the self-control required. a few more feet now as you move quickly across the easy ground I look up and see a party on a route called a dream of white horses a magnificent climb which traverses completely the Wen slab area I love solo climbing it's fast it's quick and you're away from all the intricacies of ropes works and protection devices. A party doing T-Rex in a conventional way would perhaps take two or three hours to complete the climb. As the speed of soul on the route is all too apparent. Excuse me. <laughs> Although the climbing's well easy really, it's in a an incredibly exposed position, hundreds of feet above the sea. Never become overconfident, even on the last easy stages of the climb. It's all too easy to pull a loose hold or a loose block or, or become out of balance. Here the route still demands respect. The rock still demands judgment. As you step up, you kick a hold. No, I won't use that one. Hand into the groove now. The rock's solid there. No problem. step into the groove. A route like T-Rex, the intricate nature of the climbing and the path which it follows. To look back when you're near the top, it's great. It's amazing to see where you've come from. Amazing. And the feeling now you get is tremendous. Tremendous.
you can't relive that. You have to look for something else to go and climb now. It's there for a while, but for a few minutes, and you walk back and you sit down. It's really great. No fear, just controlled effort. Well, it's been a good day. Time to go home, and I'll think about tomorrow now. Jimmy was one of the greatest of all solo climbers. He was good-humoured, endlessly enthusiastic for his sport, widely loved. He died a year after the T-Rex climb, in one of those stupid accidents that happen in straightforward situations where the concentration wavers. Down below Ciliaret, in his trainers on a wet day. Smiler Cuthbertson was on a route close by, heard him gasp out, oh shit. This film's the legacy of a beautiful climber and a delightful man. River kayaking has seen dramatic developments in recent years. Nowadays, it isn't the white water of the valleys that attract, but the gorges and waterfalls of the mountains themselves. Snowdonia is an ideal location for this new game, and since the evolution of plastic kayaks, standards have risen higher and higher. This is the Arpon Gamlam. Nobody has kayaked the falls behind them, but one day, who knows? After all, these small, purpose-built plastic boats that are still called kayaks have developed so much lately, and that, more than anything else, has been responsible for the jump in standards. Kayakers can now afford to play on water that was considered impossible only five years ago. Of course, he should have caught the paddle at the bottom since he needs it again. Even the best fails sometimes. This is Sean Baker. He was the first to venture over the bigger waterfalls in Britain. Scuda Eira in South Wales, Conway Falls and the nearby Swallow Falls in 1986, which brought attention to this extreme form of the sport. With him are Paul Crisp and in the third boat, Chris Hipgrave. The three come from the Thames Valley, but they know these mountain streams intimately because every weekend they make the long trip to Wales to enjoy their unique form of freedom. Their commitment pays off because controlling a kayak in this water isn't easy. Being able to roll immediately is imperative. Their equipment helps, but some of it has been borrowed from other sports, since conventional kayaking gear doesn't meet their requirements.
The main danger is getting trapped under the water, unable to escape, and a close inspection of the river is essential to clear any hidden hazards. Tony Jarvis joins them. The standard rises and the nature of the sport takes on a more threatening complexion. Sean goes first. Chris follows. Traditional techniques still apply here, but swift reactions are more important. It only takes the lightest of touches to keep the kayaker online and in control. Paul comes next. He looks completely out of control, with everything left to chance. Right now, he needs a barrel load of the most important quality for this sort of kayaking, self-confidence. Did you enjoy that? Yes, sure, yeah, of course I did. Come off it. Honest. This was Tony's first waterfall. He won't forget it in a hurry, but it looked like he was saving his strength for something else. And this is it. The big gorge at Clamberes offers an awe-inspiring challenge. We go to the first fall. I'm going to shoot this and then catch the break out the bottom. I'm putting myself and go to the big bastard. Well, that was a funny little fall, that one. Nice flat landing, mate. Right, here goes the big... The fall has never been attempted before, and the four men have the chance to push back the boundaries of kayaking even further. The main concern is the impact in the plunge pool. From this height, the green water will feel very hard. He is badly shaken cannot roll and is lucky not to be sucked under the water by the pressure on the back wall. He needs help fast and he gets it. But Chris also knows that his was the first descent. It's bad this, sitting at the top watching a friend hurt themselves. Not being able to help them. Not being able to hurt them and knowing you're just about to do exactly the same to yourself. Oh, I was so terrified. How do you take off? You're just amazingly fast. 
got to hit the ledge. Can you remember anything about your descent? It was fast, I wasn't in control, and it hurt. Nice and jammy, Sean. Sure. Encouraged by this useful information, Paul oh. goes next. Ah, that water. Okay, here it goes. Yes! Yes! Woo! The technique is to lean to the right to avoid the sharp rocks on the left. And then, after the big bump, straighten up and keep the kayak in front of you to punch a hole in the water to let your body enter through. Hand roll, go on, hand roll. That was a good run down. Nice throw line. Go on, pull him in, Andy, quickly. And he's got his boat, that's good. Paul has also failed to roll, being pressed against the back wall, but his entry was as perfect as he could have hoped for. Are you okay? Roll up, I had all the water coming down to my hands and the rock on the other side. So, anyway, that's my excuse for the picture. Sean is next. Ooh. Just when I was flying, when I was flying the last bit, I knew a flat landing was coming up. I just didn't have the presence of mind to tilt my boat on its side. Are you okay, Sean? Yeah. <laughs> Seriously? It's about the worst landing I've had. That was really flat, wasn't it? Oh, I was dead flat. I got the lean, I got the roll, yeah. but I didn't get your nice entry. <laughs> and so he puts all those together, he'll have a beautiful descent. Well, I Tony has plenty of confidence. But now he's got a broken rib as well. You okay? It took some weeks for Sean's back to recover and for Chris to get rid of his bruises. Paul was the only one to survive this fall unscathed. Have you now reached the limit of what's possible? It's getting there, I think. <laughs> You're certainly not going to do this one again. Yeah, it, it gets to a point where it's so high and you have so little control over the final angle of entry, for example, that you have to draw the line somewhere. And I think injuries, three out of four. I think this has got to be a good place to draw the line. Uh, without a doubt, this fall will be done again in the future. But given enough time, somebody else will do it again, and probably more successfully, having been able to see our exploits. I think there are younger people who are coming into the sport. For example, Tony, who's been brought up with this as his second waterfall. Anything smaller is going to seem easy to him. And certainly the sport's going to progress, certainly as technology increases. <laughs> Frightening. Frightening.
This particular run to me symbolises all that's best about mountain running. It's uh, it's long, it's tough, it's challenging, and it uses your resources to the utmost. The first part of the race was no problem at all. I didn't have a pacer, but um, I was very fresh, I was full of beans, it was a fantastic day, and the world was my oyster. Um, I ran over Creep of Thyskul and Creep Goch extremely fast, and chopped a considerable amount of time off Joss's record. What I was trying to do on the first section of the route was to build a large buffer in case I had any problems in the latter stages of the route. And I thought, while I'm fresh, I know this route well, I'll go as hard as I can, keep on going. Chopi o pesho calun i fyny'r elidir. A bi oedd i bod yn hwyni fi oedd rhwn i wedi cadw i fyny fo. A felly oedd i wedi pentref yn i mi gychwyn rhyw funud. Felly oedd lai no, wedyn o'n i'n disgwyl ar y wylod yn mynydd a pan oedd o thor o hwnt y tro. Eis i off a gwneud yng Ngora. Ond dwi mo bod o wedi mynd i bin bach yn gyflym yn y dechrau. Wedyn nhw wedi dechrau blino, wedyn nhw wedi rhwys i gadw oedd lai no, rhaf fwyaf ar ffordd i fyny. Nes oedd ni rhyw hanau cantlad o'r cwp a wedi'n ath o nal i fyny ac ath o ddiod, o'n i'n cario diod i ddo fawr i Gymru'n o fwyd, ie.
Wyt ti'n nhw ei o bwys ar y gwpar ei lidi'r, a wedyn nath y tri o'n i'n gario ymlaen i'r gar na glydda'r fawr. A wedyn ni'n eisiau gorau ddim yno. Coming off Glider Vach, there's there's no good route. Bristly Gully is the best of a bad lot. It's a severe, severely steep, stone-filled chute. And if you trip in that, you're in trouble. You're going to hurt yourself. Had a good pacer, came down fast, and set myself up for a fast climb up Trivan. Western Gully is really steep. I was being extremely careful in this descent. Nes i rhedeg efo bo wedyn, um, i fyny pen yr ole wen, ac uh, erbyn hynny, um, oedd yn dechrau blino ac yn dioddef ar y ffordd i fyny. Ac nath ni'n golli ychydig o amser, ond um, ar ôl cyrraedd y copa, nath o rhedeg mwy gyflym, ac oedd hi'n bron methu cadw i fyny efo bo, i fyny i Carnaeth David a Carnaeth Llywelyn. I had a severe bout of cramping up Karma Llewellyn, which made me think that the attempt could be in serious trouble.
Ken Jones stopped the watch at Volvras and it was great to see a crowd of my club mates who had come up to celebrate what was an important day for me. Warden and Hanolvana with a gorret tower, Spetus a coy that he fill a blain, Bossing Biscor Helm Goch, Batneron, a porfor, a specto, a de Dave Crook, Oganolvan Tiger, Crook and in Oganuir, Canadian, Blint Sauker Dine. Are they under a one all, but don't hide the bubble? Have you here or shortly? Are Sudi so blain and who have with them the Creo in Argoilin da? I Hellington Sea, the canoe Canadian Agored, Ventrod Erioid, Ear Durama or Blind. The Ma of Dodnessa, Adanar Tuibir. Marsiqui, an Avon Greek yog, a knit the Marse Delvet Dolly, Sicker Hyber, Canoe, where Twehan Pint, Ardanion and Dihi, and Aros Melian Darn. But he'd wait on each other, evil Knievel Erioid, your body, even Dark and Bake. Ac mae gan y bechgyn yma feddylfryd tebyg, mae'r her yn rhan o'r hwyl. I'r hafn y gyli fel mae'n cael ei galw. And how stare a son. A court gumpo, man and will both vote now drop a set, the Evligo gumpas or Golug. A carry penegrinia, mem canoe drum or Golug, a blena crocken in Damiliat. A canoe well plum near push. Prin iawn ydy'r cynnwyr caiac sy wedi mentro i'r rhan yma fetws y coed. Y cynnwyr wedi gau mewn ac ar eistedd yn y caiac wrth gwrs, dychmygwch felly pa mor anodd ydy chi ar eich penaglinie mewn cynnwyr agored sy'n llenwi efo dŵr. Un peth sydd o blaid y ddau blen a croc ydy fod na ddau i gyd reoli. At ail brif gymal yr heder a'r llithriad hira sy'n siŵr o fod yn gwymp reit hegar. Anghofiwch am ddewis llwybr fan yma. Os na ddim amdani, on Dilyn y Llif a Dalu Gredu. Dyma'r trydydd cymal a'r anodda gan fod rhaid dilyn y llwybr gorau dan yr amgylchiadau, profiad, gwybodaeth a gredd sy'n awgrymu mai ochr chwyth yr afon fel mae'r boys yn ei gweld chi pia chi. Dros na ddim arwyddion ffordd. Hyd bwysedd, hyd weithio, ar y ffyn a nelwyg honno rhwng pleser a pherigl. Pen y daith, cyrraedd y lan ac maen nhw'n heiddi eiliad fach o euphoria. Un peth sy'n fwy melys mewn chwaraeon ar tro cyntaf. Y tro cyntaf i oed 